Hey, everybody, this is Gene Marks, and welcome back to another episode of Biz Books, where I speak to great and smart authors of excellent business books. And today, yet another great and smart author. I'm speaking to Catherine Finney. Catherine is the author of Build the Damn Thing. By the way, Catherine, we're allowed to curse on the show, okay? It's okay, cool. awesome. I love that. <laughs> yeah, build the Damn Thing, How to Start a Successful Business if You're Not a Rich White Guy. And I will tell you now, I'm a white guy, but I'm not that rich. So I probably <laughs> fall... Yeah. somewhere within your audience. It was a great book, a great read. It was lots of fun, very, you know, an easy read, which is good. And I think some real essential, um, some real essential advice for entrepreneurs, frankly, Catherine, of all colors and mm -hmm. genders and shapes and sizes. It really does appeal to a giant audience. So first of all, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk with you today. Yeah, we'll have a good time talking and, and learning a little bit about this book. And, and again, this um, you know, this video will be on our YouTube channel, Catherine, and also um, through all the podcast platforms that we serve, Spotify and Apple and, and all that good stuff. So uh, a lot of people have the opportunity to listen to it. So first of all, let's talk about yourself, okay? Um, who you are, how did you come to write this book? Give me your backstory. Oh my gosh. You know, I... I it, I always say it starts in the Midwest. Um, I was born in Wisconsin, grew up in a family that was uh, pretty much working class. My father worked in a brewery and it was an amazing community to be a part of. Um, those of us who grew up in sort of the early 80s when, you know, you had these sort of manufacturing based towns and the company is really great and you had Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts together and things like that. And it was wonderful until the brewery shut down right. um, and it devastated Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And what happened in Milwaukee was no different than what's happened in most of the, the manufacturing belt of the United States, Gary, Indiana, Detroit, um, Youngstown, Ohio, places like that. But my father had this vision for himself. And so he, he took a class in C++, which is the foundational computing language and fell in love right. um, and got a job at digital equipment, which then led to a job at Microsoft and moved my family to Minneapolis, which is where I spent the latter part of my childhood. You would think I would have gone into computing because that would have made sense. Of course, right. I didn't. Right. <laughs> and went to school and became an epidemiologist at Yale. And when I came back, um, after my father was ill, didn't know exactly what I was going to do with my life and started a blog. And that blog led into a whole bunch of things because this was in the early 2000s. Mm. So before really anyone had thought about monetizing content on the web. In fact, people still thought the web was a fad. Right. And that there were no business models. They, Google AdWords was like new. That was like amazing that you could actually monetize your content. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now we kind of laugh, but back then it was like revolutionary. Sure. And so that turned into a business. I happened to have an idea, started this blog, it became a media company, and then I sold it. And then I went to go work for another woman-led startup and that got bought. So it was part of two exits pretty quickly and saw the economic impact that had mm -hmm. um, and how that allowed me to create a life that I wanted to live. Okay. Um, started an organization to give opportunities to other women like myself called Digital Divided, started off as a small organization and that grew big. And I um, transitioned from that in 2020. Now the organization has like five locations and a budget of like eight figures. I mean, something incredible. Um, and then started Genius Guild, which is my venture fund. Um, we're a small venture fund, invest in a pre-seed stage. It, and exceptional founders, um, black founders with a particular focus on women. It it didn't start off that way, but just some of the amazing investments we found happened to be led by women. Um, and we're also limited partners in other venture funds. So I get to fund other people like myself. I get the feeling that um, the, the reason for the book is because you've given this speech or variations of this speech to a lot of the people that you wanted to invest in so many times that you're like, you know what, I got to put this into a book. So instead of me just telling you this all the time, like when I first meet, I'm going to hand you this book first. And then, you know, th then we'll talk. Is that, am I right about that? Yeah. It makes my life so much easier, right? <laughs> yeah. book because it's like, here you go, read this. Yeah. Um, if, if you want to know about me and how I think about investing, and I think anyone who's thinking investing should also interview their investor too. 
Um, it is much like a marriage. We are together until the company doesn't exist anymore. So you need to know as much about me as I need to know about you. Right. And then also it helps because a lot of the advice that I give to my investments, I actually have in the book right. um, about figuring out a business model and, and using one that someone has already proven works, right? right? Like what? Right. You, you're already you're already a person who is not an entitled. You're a person who doesn't have privilege. You don't fit in a pattern. You are doing sometimes ideas and spaces that haven't quite been proven. So why make it harder on yourself than trying to also create some new business model that hasn't been proven? And so stuff like that, um, you know, also just personal things like creating a personal advisory board. Mm -hmm. That's so important. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurship is the hardest thing you can possibly do, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, um, some people would say it's irrational to be an entrepreneur, but I think us entrepreneurs, that ability to create a life that we control, um, to be able to take amazing vacations and do what we want to do is worth that uncertainty, that fear, that in irrationality. And so, um, but we, it's also hard. And so we need to make sure that we have the support. Right. Um, and until recently, there wasn't a lot of discussions on the, the mental health toll of being an entrepreneur, right. of being a builder, um, and how you need support and a different type of support than if perhaps you're working, um, at a nine to five. And so things like that, it's like all the stuff I put in the book, really, it's like 20 years of lessons, um, some of them were hard lessons and I talk about that too in hard mistakes that I've made. But um, my hope is that whoever reads the book can maybe A, see themselves in the book um, and then B, you know, learn a couple of things that maybe help them think differently about how they build their businesses. I also took away from the book as well. And we're going to dig into some of the details, but uh, you know, I know that your title says how to start a successful business, um, but I don't know. I, I I found there was a lot of lessons in here for existing business owners as well. Does that yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. No. I think there's a lot of things when you don't have a roadmap, you kind of are figuring out things as you go along, and you can right. often find that you're already on the journey, and there's some things, a couple of steps you forgot to do, a couple of stops that you forgot to make. Right. And and that's another thing that I put in this book. It's written in a way where you can jump to whatever step you want to jump to. Right. You don't have to start in the beginning. But there were things that like I didn't learn. I didn't learn. And, and at the time I was building, particularly my first company, there was not no information about venture capital. Like right. what exactly is venture capital? How does it work? And what is a VC looking for in terms of investing? In terms of investing? Like how do, even how do VCs make money? Right. right. Like, because I think it's important when you're building a business and you have a potential customer, customer or partner is to understand how they make money too. Right. Cause then you help, it helps build a partnership that's good for both. Right. But there was never any of that information when I was building a business of like, or even what type of funding opportunities or new things that have popped up like crowd equity funding. Sure. That's something that didn't really exist until really the past three or four years post the Jobs Act, right? So, so it was a lot of things that I think you can utilize even if you already have a company and maybe things you didn't even think about before. Got it. All right, so let's go to the beginning. Your, your very first step of the book talks about building an internal foundation. Um, yeah. You talk about dealing with failure. You talk about uh, you know, some of the ingredients of a great founder. You talk about bald faced lies that are told to, to builders, which I'd love to hear your comments on a couple of them. But before we even talk about that, like building your internal foundation, what? how do you define an internal foundation? The internal foundation really is what you're going to stand on as you go through this entrepreneurial journey, this process of building a company. Because it is difficult, it is important for your own health, right? Your own your own livelihood to make sure that you have something to fall back on. Sure. I call it like a personal toolbox sure. because you're going to be sense. challenged. You, you are going to be challenged. That's a guarantee. It doesn't matter um, where you're at, your gender, your race, um, you're going to be challenged. And right. so it's important to have the foundation that allows you to work through that challenge. And that's what I mean by that. 
Makes sense. That makes sense. And again, I don't want to give away everything in the book because I want people to buy this book. Like I bought this book because uh, it's it's so worthwhile. But one thing you did have in that first step, um, and you talk about building the foundation, is these bald faced lies <laughs> that yeah. are told to to builders of companies. You have five of them. I'm just wondering if you if, if you know, if any one or two of them come to mind that you'd like to comment on. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big ones is that you have to be an engineer coder in order to build a startup. Right. And you don't. Right. That you really don't, especially now. There's a lot of what we call low code or no code solutions. These are solutions where you don't have to know HTML, Rails, any of the coding languages in order to build. And that has been revolutionized by companies like Squarespace and others where if you have a product mm -hmm. um, and you want to sell it, you can get it online within an hour using one of these low code solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and that has really revolutionized and expanded um, the startup space. The other one is that you have to have gone to some like big name school in order to be a startup founder. And that's absolutely not true. Um, you, some of the biggest founders, I mean, one of the biggest would be Steve Jobs and he sure. did not go to an elite institution. In fact, he went to community college and then went to Reed college. Um, Jack Dorsey, who, you know, as founder of Stripe or, and, uh, yeah. Twitter and a whole bunch of other stuff went to the Missouri Institute of Technology. I didn't even know Missouri had an institute. Of <laughs> I didn't like, know Missouri and, has any technology at all. I didn't know that. And as he says, it was the other MIT, yeah. but like, <laughs> right. I mean, these are incredibly successful people. Most of the successful folks who are in the fortune 500, particularly, um, or the Forbes list of, of, of richest people in, in the world, particularly African-Americans, most mm -hmm. of them did not go to Ivy League institutions. Mm -hmm. Some of them didn't even actually go to any institution like mm -hmm. a Jay-Z. Um, and so if that was the metric, which has been pushed as this narrative that you had to go to Stanford, Harvard, MIT in order to be a successful founder, well, that's completely a lie. I mean, it's completely false. Catherine, I want to add something to that as well. I mean, you 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 picked us examples, I don't know, like fucking geniuses, you know? I mean, yes. Steve Jobs and Jack Dorsey, and I mean, they're, they're like Jay-Z. Yeah, I, I, I have to just also add that in my, I'm a CPA. So yeah. I, you know, we we, all, we have a few hundred clients in my in my firm. I come across many business owners, successful business owners that no mm. one's ever heard of, but are yep. successful running their businesses of all different colors. They went to Penn. I'm in Philadelphia. They went to yeah. Penn State. They went to Great school. State University. They went to university. You know, like you know, and you don't necessarily have to be a genius to be a successful business owner, mm -hmm. and you don't have to go to an Ivy League school. Um, I, I've met too many you know successful people that have gone at, at, a, at a very ordinary education, some not at all, but just have it within them to, you yeah. know, to, to do what they got to do. It's not everything has to come down to um, where you are and what you've learned. Um, so I just wanted to make that point, you know? Yeah. And they saw an opportunity. Yep. They, they created, and this is something I talk about in the book, they created something of value that other people saw value in. And they saw enough value that they were willing to pay a premium to, to get that service or that product. And that's really the key to a successful business is creating something that others find value in enough that they're going to pay a premium so that you make a profit, that they get the service that they want. That is the real true intention of a successful business. And you even say it in the foundations is um, they're not afraid to fail. Um, they've been all. there and they've done that before and they, they understand they've got, they've, they've got a, self-confidence that like, even if I fail, I'll pick up another one. You know, the best example I can give you, I know we, I want to move on because I have other questions, but I have a, I have another client, um, Trenton, New Jersey. He's like a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. I've known this guy for like 25 years. And I remember when he was just um, young and starting up his business, when we started working together, I remember saying to him like, you know, what happens if this business fails? And he's like, you know what? I'll just start something else. You know, I mean, at the time there was no internet. He was like, I'll buy a local paper from one county and another local paper from another county. And I'll go to the wanted to buy ads in one paper and the wanted to sell ads in one paper yeah. and I'll match them together. In other words, he just had the confidence saying like, yeah, I'll, I'll always be able to put food on the table. It's fine. You know, and I think yeah. you've got to have that self-confidence and expect, you know, that kind of failure. 
Um, let's move on. Let's move on. So you go to the next step in your in your journey. And again, I don't want to give too much away here, but um, you're talking about the tools that that you need to build your company. You mentioned earlier in our conversation about a personal advisory board. Um, that's one of the tools that that, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. Your personal advisory board is your team you. So we all know advisory boards for our companies, right? Those are the folks who are there to give us business advice and, and help guide the company and make sure the company is on the up and up. Your personal advisory board is there to make sure you're on the up and up. Right. They're team you. And I think one of the, the things about the personal advisory board, it doesn't have to be a mentor or anyone who's in business or anything like that. It could be whoever you feel is pro you and can help you get from a personal level what you need to do in order to make your business successful. And so um, one of the examples I use for someone to be on your, your personal advisory board is a comedian. Um, one of the hardest things, again, building a company, being an entrepreneur is a challenge. And there's going to be times where you're going to need levity. You're going to need something, one or something to make you laugh and take you out of sort of the overthinking mindset that can happen as an entrepreneur. For me, it's my son. Um, he's seven. And so when I'm having a particularly tough day, maybe I had a call with a limited partner or one of my companies is not meeting its metrics, right. you know, I can turn to my son. And it's really hard to feel extra stressed when you have a seven-year-old singing about people in the toilet, <laughs> just really just things. And it brings you out of whatever you're at and helps you to kind of see the bigger picture. Um, you know, another one, a person I say is somebody who can tell you what you need to hear and you can listen. Right. So we often have people who can, who give us advice. You'll get tons of advice, right? As you're building your companies. Sure. But there's very few people you actually listen to. And it's important to have on your advisory board the person who can tell you and you also listen. And you're probably listening because you know they come from a place of of love. Who's that who's that person for you? For me, it's my my friend Darlene Gillard Jones. We started off not as friends, we started off working together. And throughout the years, she's helped me build a number of things. And she's very good at putting a mirror up to my, me and saying, Is this really, is this the real Catherine? Is this really what you want to do? Or or even answering the simply question, the simple question of why are you doing this? Sure. sure. Which is like such a <laughs> you know, if you, you know, as as leaders, when someone asks you that and then you don't have the answer, you're like, okay, then maybe I shouldn't be doing this. I don't have an answer. Sure. I'm not being intentional and thoughtful and mindful with my decisions as a as a leader, as an entrepreneur, then maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Sure. Um, yeah. And so having that person becomes very, very important um, because it helps you to stay on the road that you need to go on because it's so easy to get off and go in different directions when you're building something. Um, and so staying focused and having that person who can make sure and reflect back to you that you you are definitely doing what you say you're going to do is super important. Catherine, what is an exit number? Mm. <clears throat> Yeah. So the exit number is the number in which you can leave your job to pursue what was once your side gig as your full-time gig. And, and I put that in there because if you are not entitled, if you're not like a rich white guy, um, the 99% of us, right. Who aren't that you can't just leave your job. Like you, you actually need to have income. Either you have a family or you have other needs, or maybe you don't have a cushion or whatever. You need you need to make sure that whatever you're doing um, is a little bit more certain. And, and so the exit number isn't a set number. And someone wants to ask me, why didn't you put a set number in there? And I said, because what I need to live and grow is not going to be the same as what you need 100%. to live and grow. You know, when I right? started my business... Um... It was actually with my father back in the day. And I had a full-time job as a controller at a company. This was like in the 90s. And um, I, I had an exit number. My, my exit number was what the, what I needed from a monthly income to just, you know, cover mm -hmm. my, my bills. You know, my exactly. more had a family, you know. Um, and you're right. Different. If, if I didn't have three kids at the time, uh, maybe my exit number could have been a lot mm -hmm. lower or a lot different. So everybody's mm -hmm. exit number is different, right? But it's, it's but it's the different. number. But it's the number you're saying it is the number that someone needs to leave their job, not necessarily because 
some people might interpret an exit number um, and this does have relevance um, mm -hmm. when they have an established business. Yep. And to yep. say, this is, I'm building a business. And when I build it to this valuation where mm -hmm. I can sell it for a certain, that's my exit number too. Yes. And, and that is another way to think of exit numbers. The way I thought about when I sold my company was what is it that I want to yes. build and sell at? And what is the number that makes me go, okay, I'm, I'm done and you can have it. Yeah. I mean, I think in this way, it's kind of taking that, but repurposing it to those who are getting started, right? And earlier in the process. Right. And, and I, that's I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I apologize for interrupting you. Go ahead. No, no. I actually think it's a good exercise because when you do get to the point that you've built your company and you're looking at exiting, you kind of have that, that muscle already trained because you did it at the beginning to leave the other thing. And so, yeah, I mean... One of the, the problems I have when people say things like, you know, you have to sacrifice your latte or, or what have you is it doesn't look at who we are as human beings. And for example, it may be, you know, in the era of Zooming, you know, 12 hours a day, that getting that morning coffee is the only time that you actually connect with someone else. Mm -hmm. And it may be the break that you need. It's it's the, re that gives you the energy to get through the day. It may be the community that helps you um, talk about ideas or maybe get new ideas. And so for someone to say, get rid of the latte without recognizing that maybe that latte is more than just a latte, maybe it's something more, I thought was just really short-sighted. Um, you have three children. You may live in a community where your kids have to go to private school, right. that there might not have been great public schools. Right. And so to say that your exit numbers should be this and private schools should be something that you you don't provide for your kids, that, that doesn't make any sense. That may not be realistic for where you're at. And so the exit number really is based upon you. It's not what you need to live a bling bling life. It's what do you need basically to live a life that's going to allow you to focus and grow your business. And I just have to add it because a lot of people ask me about starting up businesses. And I always say you need capital, um, mm -hmm. not, not capital is time and money. And that, that's a different conversation about time. But when it comes to money, it's exactly to your point about an exit number. If you're going to quit your job, you better damn well have thought out how you're going to pay your bills because it's a cold, mm -hmm. hard world out there when you start your business. And exactly. a, a lot of people will wish you well and pat you on the back and all that kind of stuff, but no one's writing you any checks. So mm -hmm. you, you really have to make sure that you have that in your mind. Okay. Catherine, um, who invented the desktop interface and why is that important? Yeah. So, you know, when you talk to most people, they would say like Microsoft, right? right. Maybe Apple, but most people would say, you know, Windows 95 was, was where it came through. And it actually started many, many years before with Xerox, um, who actually had invented it. Um, and it was, the story goes, and, and there are some disputes of exactly what the story goes. But the story goes is that Xerox was presenting at a computing conference. And um, Steve Jobs saw it, uh, Microsoft saw it very early. Um, right. He got it. Park or something. I forget the name of the it's Xerox. Park. It was Park, P A R C. Yeah. Um, but, but Steve was, they were developing um, the uh, Lisa computer. And I don't know if anyone could remotely remember the Lisa computer because it was like, 40, almost 50 years ago. I'm pretty sure um, it ended temporarily Steve Jobs' career at Apple. <laughs> it did, it ended him. <laughs> but they were developing and they were looking for an interface for it. Right. Um, and he saw it at this conference. It's like, this this idea is great. And so Apple then duplicated it. Um, and then Microsoft was like, wow, that, that looks great in an Apple computer. And then they duplicated what Apple had duplicated from Xerox. Um, and Microsoft had did it better, right? They did right. it better than right. everyone else. Right. Um, and hence, most of us now think when we think of desktop interface, we think of Microsoft. Right. Um, those of us who still use desktops. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I, I wrote about that in a book to illustrate the point of that it doesn't matter who first thought of it. It matters who did it the best and who executed it. And execution is so important. Important. And oftentimes when I meet with founders um, and young entrepreneurs, they'll tell me about this great idea and they don't want to share it with anybody and they're so afraid that someone's going to steal it. 
And I often say to them, well, one, I'm pretty sure I probably have heard of this idea before. So what <laughs> you think is unique is, is not really unique. Right, right. And then two, it doesn't matter what the idea is. It matters more who executes it and who executes right. it well. Right. Um, and so I always talk about the Microsoft thing because no one thinks of Xerox as developing anything around computing. If anyone thinks of Xerox, it's usually with copies, right? Right. But they were the ones who did it, and right. but they don't get the credit. You know, it's a fascinating example, and you know, I, I sometimes mention as well, like in this world, I don't know how many new ideas there really are, as opposed mm -hmm. to just being variations of other ideas. But I do know if you want to start up a business, if you want to be a blacksmith in 2022 and make yeah. iron products and horseshoes, if you're really good at it and you've got an innovative way to do it or a real cost-effective way to do it, you can be a success you know, at, at, at running yeah. a blacksmith, but you don't have to be in the 16th century to be successful at running a blacksmith business. So I, I think there's room for all, but you're right. As long as you've just, you figured out how to execute and do it that much better, yeah. it's not like the idea has to be new and innovative. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I, I think it's a great point. Okay. I would like to hear the story. Now you say you, you do tell this in the book. So this is why it'd be nice for you to just give a, an abridged version of how you, you built your first MVP for digital undivided. Mm. So first of all, I'd like you to explain or how I didn't do it and, <laughs> yeah, and how you did it. So walk us through this. Yeah. You know, initially I came out of the startup that I worked for called Blogger that got bought and I wanted to basically create a, a space for other women of color startup founders. Okay. I spent a lot of time going to different conferences and was often the only one. And so went to blog her, said, hey, I have this idea. They're like, oh, it sounds great. We're going to not only give you a little bit of seed money, but we're also going to give you the blueprint. And so anytime you're building something, this goes back to our other conversation about Microsoft. Yep. There's nothing wrong with taking what other people have already done, right? They've already learned a lot. Right. So, so why not piggyback on what someone else has learned? Right. Which is what I did when I started Digital Divide. I had this like, you know, blueprint. What I did wrong was I jumped head first and spending quite a bit of my own money and developing it. Rather than doing something small, I went for the end goal, which was this, we're going to do this big conference and have, you know, all these people come instead of thinking, maybe I should just do a dinner and let me invite some folks who are in the space and let me invite also a couple of, of different companies. And I can start to get a feel for whether, what is their appetite to really invest in this? What is their appetite to really support it? And also I could learn what exactly do they want to support? I did none of that. Um, that would have been too logical. Uh, <laughs> I went head first in and learned very quickly that what I was building wasn't aligned with what the customer, which at, at that time were enterprise corporations were buying. Right. They wanted, um, we were building and working with innovators and entrepreneurs and they wanted employees. They didn't want people to innovate. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did not learn that until about a year or two in like really grasp that. Um, and, and that was a lesson for me, particularly in, you know, with your MVP, it really is the minimal viable product. Start with the smallest thing you could do. A dinner would have cost at max. I don't think it would, the dinner would have even cost me anything. I probably could have got somebody to sponsor it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and it would have been no cost to me. And I've gathered all of this information on what we should be building. Mm. Fortunately for me, um, you know, my ex-husband would often joke to me that, you know, that thing that tells you not to jump off the bridge. I don't have that. Gene. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't have it. Um, fortunately for me, I, I didn't have that gene. So I pushed through and digital divide is an amazing, successful organization now. But at the beginning, I, I spent too much money. I didn't listen. I didn't get the feedback that I needed. Sure. And it's so hard to hear the feedback when you're building. When you think your idea is the greatest thing in the world, the last thing you want to hear is that maybe it's not good. Maybe maybe your baby's ugly. Uh, I mean, maybe it's not good. You don't want sure. to hear that, right? Sure. sure. Um, and so, and that's what I learned in, in building the MVP for Digital Divided. 
So it's really, you know, being open to the feedback and learning from the feedback, measuring yeah. the feedback as well. Measuring it. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, we all suffer from that people that start up businesses because you go into it sort of with rose colored glasses, right? Mm -hmm. They're not as data driven as they should be. And you, yeah. you wrote about the importance of data. And I'm kind of curious when you're starting up a business, every business has different types of data, right? Yeah. That you can measure yeah. its success. Is there any common forms of data that, you know, any startup business owner needs to be turning to? Is it cash flow? Is it profitability? Is it, you know, is it something that you're like, for all businesses, you really got to make sure that, that, that you are covering these metrics to make sure that you're heading in the right direction, at least. Yeah, I think it depends on the type of business. If you're yeah. a small business, you know, small businesses, many are not necessarily looking at trying to, you know, scale to be larger business or have, you know, sort of high growth curves. And so for those businesses, um, and particularly those that are service businesses, you know, you want to look at profitability. That becomes a really important factor for you, right? Sure. Sure. Um, and, and your ability to cover your day-to-day -day expenses, um, okay. namely a salary for you, because oftentimes small businesses forget heads of small businesses forget to incorporate their own themselves. salary yeah. <laughs> like themselves. Right. And, and, and why, why is it important to include yourself in a, you know, as, as part of the overall expenses? Because if you are not good as a CEO, your company is not good. <laughs> you have to be motivated to, sure. and many are motivated by the end goal of, you know, maybe profitability, but again, going back to that exit number, you you also need to eat as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then also, I think too, in terms of selling a company, it becomes very hard to sell the company if you as a CEO don't incorporate your own expense in there. Because many times when people are looking at purchasing companies, um, whether it be an M&A or just another small business buying you, they want to see the total cost of the yeah. business. And they may have to hire someone and that person is probably not going to work for free like you. That's so, right. you know, you, you, it's important if you're looking at potentially selling your company at some point to in, include those expenses. Yeah, if you're a startup scary. though, it's a different story. Startups may not be focused on profitability because you're focused on a really extreme growth curve. Right. You want to grow as quickly as humanly possible. And you often have, investment from people like myself to help fuel that. So you don't have to worry about profitability or revenue, at least not in the early stages. Um, that becomes a little bit later as, as you get bigger. We want you to grow as fast as possible. And we don't want you to worry about like profitability and making money and things like that. That's actually the one area I see most of founders, particularly founders of color and women founders get tripped up on. Um, is the sense of, you know, really amazing companies that are, that have great cash flow, great revenue, but not moving as quickly. And that's because there isn't a lot of venture capital dollars invested in women and people of color. Less than 2% of venture dollars went to women last year. Right. So it's not like these founders are, you know, not understanding what's going on. They are very much understanding what's going on. The problem as a VC though, is in, I have to figure out what company, once I give them the money is going to take that fuel and use it as a fuel for growth. So when you're a startup, you're not necessarily looking at profitability. You're looking at your growth metrics. You're looking at customer acquisition costs. You're looking at your, your MRR, your monthly recurring revenue, um, and how that's growing. Is that growing, you know, 20% month over month? Those are the sort of metrics that you're looking at. You're looking at more the growth metrics and less the financial metrics. But because you that's what's going to allow you to raise your next round. You do still have to be somewhat careful about that. I mean, a lot of, as you and I are speaking right now, and you know, we're, we're in August of 2022. Yeah. There, there's been tens of thousands of layoffs among startups around mm -hmm. the country because mm -hmm. uh, the cost of capital has gone up so much with the increase in, you know, in, in interest rates, yep. and of course, the slowdown in the economy. So a lot of those growth minded companies, which are doing the mm -hmm. right thing, they weren't showing profitability. And then all of a sudden the capital spigot yeah. gets turned off and then they're kind of, they're kind of fucked in a way, you know what I yeah. mean? <laughs> so there is a balance, well, right? There's a balance. And then what happened to a lot of those companies is, and that's why I said to a certain point, Yes, right? That the yes. growth, yes. what happened to those companies, they focus so much on growth 
they went past the point where growth becomes the metric. Right. Um, so they were in their later stages, right? They're in their series A, their series B, some even series C, where at that point, once you hit series A, which is you used to be, and this has changed drastically. Um, series A was the, the point in which you raised after like your true institutional funding, like where right. you had the big VCs come in with the big dollars, meaning the tens of millions of dollars. That's of course changing and it's been very fluid. Right. Um, but at that point, in order to justify giving you tens of millions of dollars as a VC, not only do I need to see your growth, I also need to see your revenue. Yes. And I also need to see not necessarily profitability, but definitely revenue mm -hmm. and how your revenue and your growth are tied together, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And a right. lot of those companies, what you saw is that they had incredible growth, but no revenue to back it up. Right. Um, there is no investor in the world who would not give more investment to a company that is growing rapidly and their revenue is also growing rapidly. Like they're, they're, so those companies weren't marriaging the two. They were just solely focused on growth. Got it. Okay. Um, listen, we have limited time and I, there's so much great information in this book. You do a whole section, a whole chapter about building your teams. And, yeah. um, you know, it, I, I don't have to give you specific questions, What I want, I mean, listen, we're, we're in a period right now where we have historical low unemployment. We yeah. have, um, you know, and yet we still have, you know, close to 11 million unfilled jobs that are out there for skilled workers. However, labor is short and people are looking for good talent. Startups are particularly looking for good talent. They have funding issues for good talent. They're competing against bigger and more established companies. I guess, Kev, let me give me your thoughts on employees. You know, when do you hire and what do you look for? And you know, what have you learned about hiring people? I have learned so much about hiring people. <laughs> because you like, and, I have probably and, made a million mistakes <laughs> along the way. And right? I've gotten like so much better. I yeah. think um, one of the things that's been really helpful is centering our core values. So what we did at Genius Guild is spent quite a bit of time on our core values. Like what is it that we believe in and what is it that we stand for? And by centering that, it helps us to really see when someone doesn't fit those. Okay. And it doesn't mean that they're bad people. It's just that here's what we value and maybe what we value and what they value isn't the same thing. That's been very, very helpful in terms of hiring. Right. Um, and, I, and I encourage people to do that. Usually core values is like a light and fluffy thing that you pass off to someone else. It really does have an impact in your company um, and who you hire. And, and I want to even add to that. I mean, you know, listen, I mean, half employees out there right now are either millennials or Gen Zers. They have a different take on, on mm -hmm. work and companies than yep. people of my generation do. They want to work for a company where their values align and they feel like they're doing a good thing. And so you're right. And, and a lot of companies, I think, pass off this core values thing. Like, oh, let's not let my attorney write it up for us, you know, where it really should come from the heart. It probably should be like a real priority of the founding CEO of the company, right? Yeah. Yeah, no. I mean, it really should be. It, it helps attract people to you. Right. Um, and so, and that's a very external thing, but internally it also helps create guideposts, right. um, which is also super important as well. Right. Uh, you know, one of the challenges that I've had of just being a CEO for a while now in terms of hiring is sometimes, and my chief of staff always reflects this back to me. She's a little bit more tough than me, <laughs> but like, you know, I, I forget, you know, one of our uh, core values is be human. And one of the things that I have found is that um, sometimes, even as a CEO, people don't see your humanity. Right. Um, and, I, you know, and, and that's been really interesting because you're the leader, you're supposed to be infallible, right? You're not yeah. supposed to have any sort of issues. Right. But one of the things that we've created and it's been really helpful has been to allow me as a CEO to be a human being as well. Right. Um, and- In what way? Like, what, what do you- have? How do you let people see yourself be a human being? Do you show up in like jeans and a and a t-shirt or you know? <laughs> well, we're techie, so like you know, it's kind of wherever you want to wear. Right. You know, um, you know, one of the ways was this past summer has been just like a, a period of great transition for me. I got a divorce. My grandmother, who I'm named after, passed away. It was just oh, a lot man. of transition for me at once. And my team, we went on a team retreat, and younger members were like you know, first of all, Catherine's on Bumble. That was like a big conversation. And then, then they were like, let us see your Bumble profile. And I was like, oh my God, like, this was like, touch my pearls. Like, okay. But what happened was 
the the mentor became the mentee. Yeah. And that the team were able to give me lots of advice. They were like, I you put that know. in your profile. You never put that in your profile, right? You got to change. Yeah, they were like, this is wrong. This is the wrong picture. And then they went through people and they're like, he's he, he's too poor for you. He's too short for you. <laughs> like, like, I mean, but what was great about it was yeah. one, it, it, it allowed them to teach me something and sure. they loved that. They sure. loved that. Sure. Um, That's interesting. And, 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 you know, still look at me as a mentor and things like that. That didn't change your role, but it was like, I can give to you. Yeah. And I think particularly with younger, um, I'm like a borderline millennial Gen X, but definitely with Gen Z and even the younger millennials, that ability to teach you something as, as a leader, as a CEO is very, very important to them. Right. Um, that you're not seeing this, this distant entity that's in some room that they can't talk to or relate to. Right, right. I find more and more, particularly because of working from home and uh, there's been a, a much less of a, a relaxation and formalities um, within yeah. businesses. Um, so I think seeing you on Bumble, I think is hilarious and that's a funny thing to do. And yet at the same time, they see you in action at work. Yeah. And they, so they're like, all right, Catherine is like really good at her job and what she does. Although she's yeah. not so great on Bumble. And, needs right. there. Right. and I think that endears you to your staff. I mean, you know, it makes them connect with you that much. They better. loved it. They love it. And they'll ask periodically, like, how are things going? Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, that's, like... Which is something I forgot. I mean, it creates an ongoing conversation and that is, that is really fun. Um, yeah. What what do you look for in new employees? You write about this, you know, in your book about you know hiring people. Um, yeah. I myself, I just I don't. I mean, I am I'm 57. I am one of the worst hires in the world. Everybody I interview for a job, they all seem fine. You know, I mean, yeah. like their resumes are good. They're all good people. I always feel like I could give this person a chance. I'm sure maybe they'll. It's just yeah. for me, it's always like a crapshoot. And I know that's wrong. You got to be a little bit different. So. What what do you do when you hire? What would you uh, what would you recommend to startup founders when they're looking to hire their first few employees? Yeah, you know, I, those first few employees are so crucial. Yeah. Um. Right. And so one of the things I always say is bring somebody else in, right. not just you. Good. Um. You 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 need to have another opinion uh, on that. Um. There are times where again I'm very gung ho pro people. So I'm like they're great. Let's hire them. And again, my chief of staff would be like, no. Right. Right. And and we'll give reasons. It's never just like a no, but give reasons. Right. So I think that's that's important. I think if you can to do a trial, particularly with them as a consultant, I always think that that's really, really great. Like a 1099 um, or something, like have like a 1099 right? as a trial. Yeah. Be, for many reasons. One, they can find out about you and you can find out about them. And you don't make that sort of commitment to working together. Um which can be costly. Uh, you, yeah. you know, might have to do workers' comp or like unemployment insurance, like all these different things that you have to pay for. Yep. You don't have to pay for it, and you guys can both test each other out. It's like a date. Yep. I usually say don't make it longer than than ninety days, even shorter if you can. I find with employees, I know pretty quickly within thirty days whether or not this is going to like work or not. So you don't need to like extend it forever. I don't believe in keeping people on 1099s forever unless that's their choice. Sure. Um, and but I think it's a great way to test out the relationship, test out how you work together. Um, I have found when I don't do that, I, I get into trouble. Mm. Um, particularly when you're a very public person like myself. Mm. And so people come with whatever notion they have about you because you're in public. Mm -hmm. Um, and that often creates some challenges, some, uh, you know, some insecurities. We live in a very celeb driven culture. Mm -hmm. So, so having that other person there, having the test, you know, like how do they respond, you know, when we're put in these sort of situations um, is really, really super important. I'll, I'll share a really quick story. When I was at Digital and Divided, we were hosting Stacey Abrams. Okay. Um, she came and it was right when she was running the first time. So it was all this media. It was like other celebrities. There was like this whole big deal. And so we had a team member um, who just completely shut down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was like the all hands on deck. The, the internet wasn't working well. The face, I mean, like, you know, everything was like shutting down. Mm -hmm. And this person spent two hours cutting cake, mm -hmm. cutting slices of cake okay. in the most perfect cake slices you've ever seen okay 
And, and it was because she didn't know how to be in the environment. It was overwhelming for her. Right. And sometimes what happens when you're overwhelmed, you're overwhelmed, you go and do the thing that you know, right? Yeah. And I think you anybody who's ever had employees, your thumb. <laughs> right? Anyone who's ever had employees who maybe were being asked or were positions that were overwhelming for them probably have seen this where yeah. we call it cutting cake internally. Yeah. They were cutting cake. Cake, right someone's cutting cake because they don't know what to do they're overwhelmed it's not the correct position for yeah. them yeah it's not the right job so they right. go to the one thing they know right. and they do that over right. and over again even if that's not what you need them to do even right. if you told them differently right. they do that because that is what they know and so <laughs> we have seen that cutting cake a number of times and i think as a as a ceo your job is to find people and match them with what it is that they're great at right. and to avoid as much as possible the cutting cake and doing that sort of trial helps you to see what it is that person's good at and make sure that you don't get in a, a cake cutting situation. How do you know though? I mean, if you're just hiring somebody and it's, you know, you don't really know the person, you got their resume, maybe you've got some referrals, but you've never really seen them in action. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you know, how do you figure that out? Do you, I guess you just have to ask the person like, Based on all the things we need done here, you know, you know, what do you feel like you'd be best at doing? Is that is that the approach that you would take? Or or even just, you know, describe to me if you have a particular task that you need. So you're, you know, an accountant and yeah. you need someone who can enter things in QuickBooks. Right. 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 And so maybe one of the questions is explain to me a time in which you had a challenging experience with QuickBooks. Right. And how did you solve it? Right. Right. What boring, like, what a boring question that is, but a relevant one. <laughs> right. But, but it's relevant, right? Because that's what an accountant need. would find that interesting. <laughs> like <laughs> you, you need, that's the work you need done. Yes. Or if it's like you're a cobbler yes. and you're like, I, you know, give me a time where someone asked you to fit a shoe that was too small for them. Right. right. Well, how did you handle that? How did you solve that? Tell me how you solved that problem. And so you're giving people specific problem solving questions that are open ended. They're not yes or no. That is relevant to the work you actually need them to do. Now, if they're really good, they probably will be able to answer and you might not be able to like still figure it out. But often what happens when you ask like a very specific skill set question like that, you start to see people who maybe don't have it and you can start to see their their wheels turning in their heads, right? And, and then you're like, oh, this shouldn't be a hard question for you to ask. Cause if you do QuickBooks every day, you should be able to answer this fairly, fairly easy. Sure. It's a softball question. If you are a QuickBook expert, sure. right? Sure. Sure. That's a great advice. That is great advice. Well, Catherine, listen, I lied to you at the beginning of our conversation. I said, we'd be uh, talking for about a half an hour. It's almost an hour that we've been talking because <laughs> uh, it, it's that interesting. And, and for those of you guys watching this and listening We've covered a small, uh, you know, just a very small portion of what's in Catherine's book. The book is called Build the Damn Thing, How to Start a Successful Business if You're Not a Rich White Guy. Uh, I've been speaking to Catherine Finney. Catherine, uh, thank you so much. We'll, we'll put up, a, you know, the, the book cover, people are seeing it now and, and there'll be a URL to buy it. Uh, but I want to wish you the best of success with the book. It's really excellent. Thank you. It was great fun. It was a lot of fun as well. Everybody, you've been listening to Biz Books. My name is Gene Marks. Thank you so much for listening and watching. We'll be back in two weeks with another interview with a great author like Catherine. So again, thanks for joining. We'll see you soon. Take care.